How about now? Better? Okay. Uh, so, um, sorry, my cat. <laughs> All right. So, um, good morning. It is my um, absolute pleasure to be here today and to be leading off this excellent workshop. Um, I'm going to start with a brief but hearty thank you to the organizing committee for um, bringing us all together in this way. This is really exciting. And of course, to the National Science Foundation for funding this work. So I'm going to, oh, let's see, I'm going to set it down. Oh, that's pretty dim. I don't know. Can you guys see that? Tiny. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to eventually uh, today um, talk about an example of a coupled tectonics and surface processes project related to M9 earthquakes in the Cascadia subduction zone and the landscape's response to those earthquakes. But before I get to that, I want to do a little bit of setting the stage. Um, so, uh, oh, now you can hear me, or the mic seems to be picking up. Okay. Um, so I want to do a little bit of setting the stage before I go off on that example. And I want to want to do this so that I can really sort of put in perspective, as Greg mentioned, um, my vision or the community's vision about sort of big questions and progress and challenges in coupled tectonics and surface processes studies in the future. Um, I've been, I've really been looking forward to this meeting actually since, since years ago when it was first brought up by Mark at a systems meeting one spring as a possibility. And my enthusiasm for this workshop waned only just a little <laughs> a few weeks back when I got an email from the conveners saying, by the way, you're first. You're going to set off the meeting first. Um, and, and wouldn't it be great if, if during this presentation you touched on you know, what you think are the sort of big, important questions and, and, and the progress and challenges, which felt like a really tall order. Um, but the good news for me and the good news for us is that our communities have actually been engaging in a deep dive on these very questions over the last year plus. And so, um, I'm going to highlight some things from two initiatives that many of you in this room have been a part of and many people watching online would have been a part of. And those initiatives are the challenges and opportunities for research in tectonics and the SC4D initiative to try and understand the processes that underlie subduction. Both of these initiatives have recently presented um, NSF vision documents, which you can find online. Um, and I'm going, I promise I'm not going to read, I'm not going to read through this. I'm not going to spend my time going through all these documents but I certainly encourage you to look at them because they're really well written. Um, but in both of these documents, um, they outline grand challenges or big questions that the community is trying to make big progress or is poised to make big progress in over the next generation. And I'm very pleased to see um, that in both documents, there's a, a highlight of the themes of understanding the dynamics and interactions among our surface processes and tectonics. So we know this is important and the community recognizes this recognizes this as well. And so I think the timing of this workshop couldn't be any better um, because I think there's a lot of momentum in the community and we really want to capitalize on that. Um, and so it's very exciting at this time. So I'm going to just highlight a few things that really resonated with me from these documents to sort of trip off our conversation today. I um, mean, the first thing that everyone in this room will be pleased to see is that um, the communities agree that it's the, uh, about the importance and in fact, the necessity of models in our efforts to try and understand surface processes and tectonics. And we want to link deep models with surface processes models. And we want to, we want to think about how these models will operate both over short-term sort of earthquake hazards timescales and link those into sort of longer-term mountain building timescales. And that's going to be one of the themes that I talk about in the example that I give you today. A couple other things. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that um, our community seem to really value interdisciplinary centers. Um, and open source community resources and organizations, things like the CIG and the CSM, CSEMS. And we hope that um, we'll see continued funding for those in the future, and in fact, even more of them. Along that same vein, um, there was a lot of emphasis in these documents that progress going forward will happen only when we have collaborative sharing of data, equipment, technology, labs, even sharing of things like training our next generation users of frontier techniques, so I really like things like CIDR or the NSAID summer schools, you know, so that graduate students aren't just trained in a single lab with a single PI, but instead, you know, trained by the community. And there's just one last point here that I want to emphasize, and this wasn't really written in any of these documents explicitly, but I think it's very important, is that I think it's, it's really useful to identify, and tackle, and strategize these research problems that we have collective interest in together from the very beginning. 
So I think it's really common for people to collaborate, but they often do this in sort of a siloed fashion. So you might be on a big project where you're working with a geophysicist and you're a geomorphologist, and you kind of you, you get it funded together, but maybe you work on it separately, and then later on you sort of come back together and say, this is what I found, what did you find, and you try and kind of glom those things together. And that's useful, but I think it's even better to start from scratch, sort of from the beginning with a blank canvas and say, okay, what, what are our collective interests? What are, how do we want to strategize and tackle these problems together from the beginning? So I think we have an opportunity to do that over the next coming days, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And I hope that this is one of many of, our, of those opportunities. I hope this workshop that we're doing today doesn't happen in isolation, and I, I hope we continue to do that. So now I'm going to give an example of a project that I think um, kind of hits on a lot of those points that I just mentioned. And this is the UW um, so-called M9 project. Um, M9 here stands for magnitude 9. And this project is a really large project. It was, um, it was generously funded by NSF, the, the Seas Hazards Initiative. So this is a $3 million project um, led by University of Washington researchers in collaboration with USGS scientists. So you can see there's lots of names here. This list could be even longer. Um, and the idea, the main thrust of this project is that we're simulating in 3D magnitude 9 earthquakes on the Cascadia megathrust. And we're considering all of the consequences that come from those events. This is a truly interdisciplinary uh, project. Many of the names listed here are people outside of the geosciences. So in this case, we're working across departments across the university. Social scientists are working with engineers, are working with geologists, are working with urban planners, applied mathematicians, and statisticians to tackle this problem. Before I started working on this, my view of interdisciplinary was when I walked to the fourth floor to talk to geochemists or the second floor to talk to space physicists. <laughs> and this has really sort of broadened my horizons on what an interdisciplinary project really looks like. Um, so before I tell you the details of this project, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with a little background about um, Cascadia. Not everybody lives there and thinks about it all the time. Um, so the Cascadia subduction zone, which I'm showing a, an image of here, you can see the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting beneath the North American plate. And we know that the Cascadia subduction zone has a history of M9 earthquakes. And we know this from records of coastal subsidence, tsunami records, and offshore turbidites. We also know that the last Cascadia earthquake happened in 1780, January of 1780, and it was estimated to be between a magnitude 8.7 and 9.2. And we also know that we can estimate the probability of a 10 to 14% chance of another M9 earthquake happening in the next few years. So we need to think about this um, both from a scientific perspective and from a hazards perspective. All right, so this is a nice little graphic that really showcases um, the project and its many different pieces. So the overall goal of our project is to reduce the catastrophic potential of Cascadia earthquakes through advances in hazard assessment and adaptive planning. So I'm showing in this, this little nice cartoon by a graduate student named Nasser Marathi in civil engineering um, that the, the real um, sort of, uh, oh, actually, before I show you the, this, I want to just show these are the names of the departments of people that are involved in this project. And also, I, I want to say that um, we're not just working on this within the university, that this project has many stakeholders outside of the university that have been vested and involved in the project including the state of Washington, state of Oregon, national agencies like FEMA, and then local uh, consulting firms and city of Seattle. So it's been very, um, very uh, broad in terms of those who are interested in the outcomes of this project. All right, so as I mentioned that the, the sort of heart of this project are the 3D um, seismic simulations that are being carried out by Art Frankel and Aaron Wirth, um, who are USGS scientists who are affiliated to the University of Washington. And um, what they're doing is they're simulating um, M9 earthquakes. And from those simulations, we get broadband synthetic seismograms. And these simulations are really sophisticated so that they accurately capture really important things like rupture directivity, basin amplification, edge converted waves, and long duration, which are all things that are going to happen in the production zone. And then from um, these simulations, there's a whole bunch of us who are working downstream that want to take that output and think about what it is that that kind of ground shaking or strong ground motion will do um, to things like building an infrastructure, and in my case, to the hill slopes. How do the hill slopes react to that? And from um, the scientific output, we can do things like um, work on early warning and um, help the community plan for enhanced resilience. 
and work on integrated risk maps. So I don't have time today to speak about each of these things, so I'm really going to focus my attention on what we've been finding with respect to the landslides, um, but I'm certainly happy to entertain any questions that you have either during the question time or over a chat uh, during a break about any of the other aspects that we've been talking about. So as you can imagine, when you shake the ground as hard as you do in, in a magnitude 9 event, especially one that reaches, say, from Northern California all the way to Vancouver, um, quite terrifying to think about, <laughs> um, you're going to have a really strong landscape response. And so there are a group of us, um, myself, my colleague Joe Wortman, and our graduate students, Charlene Hill and Alex Grant, who have been working on the landscape response uh, that we might expect to see from the Pacific Coast. So before I show you the results from that work, I'm going to spend just a few more minutes talking about what these simulations are and give you a little, show you a little example movie, hopefully it'll run, of what a simulation looks like. All right, so Art and Aaron have got um, 50 plus separate scenarios of M9 events. Um, and so this is really exciting because the work prior to this usually focused on one single sort of worst case scenario. But in doing 50 different scenarios, we can do things like actually have a probabilistic view of what the ground shaking might be. And what we're after is really understanding what the range of possible ground shaking might be from an M9 event, and also what are the critical rupture parameters. And so in doing this, we varied a lot of different, um, um, different parameters. Uh, and uh, what we found is that the strength of ground shaking would depend most on things like the hypocenter. So that's the starting position of the earthquake. So we varied that from central, um, northern, or southern portions of the megathrust. We also know that it's very important where the actual um, rupture initiates, so the insular, inland or eastward extent of the rupture is quite important. And finally, one of the most important things, especially at the high frequencies which affect the shaking of the hill slopes, are the location of strong ground motion generating areas or sticky patches. Um, you might know these as sub-events or high stress drop asperities along um, the subduction zone. And we know from examples like the Hopu in Japan that the, these things end up being the most important elements for generating strong ground motion. So when we vary where those sticky patches are, um, we can get a, a range of different shaking. So the main takeaway is that there are a wide range of possible outcomes that we need to consider when thinking about strong ground motion for M9 events. And I also want to point out that um, so these there's a, a, a two companion papers that should hopefully be out soon in BSSA where you can read about this um, about uh, this work. But also we um, have put all 50 of these simulations up on the Design Safe site so that we can share this data with the public in that way. So um, you can go ahead over to Design Safe if you're in the actual output of this work. So now I want to show you, oh, come on towards me, um, an example movie of the output. So you can see the hypocenter is over there. We've got an M9 earthquake happening. Um, and these are four um, seismic stations. And you can start to see what the seismic waves look like coming into those stations. And I just want to point out a few things. So this is just one of those 50 simulations. And one thing I want to point out is that as we would expect, see that the ground shaking or the seismic waves are quite intense um, at Crescent City, which is pretty close um, to the shoreline, which would make sense. But I also want to point out what looks really intense right here, which is Seattle. And that's because Seattle sits in a basin. And so one of the, the real steps forward in this work was including things like basin effects. And you can see that it has a pretty profound impact on the seismic waves. It, it amplifies those seismic waves. And, and you can see the same is happening in Portland to a lesser extent. This is an example of a, a station that's outside of the basin and you can see it much more present right there. So the city of Seattle was quite interested in this result because um, this has big effects on, for example, the tall buildings in the city, which have not been um, coded to include things like basin effects and M9 earthquakes. Um, there was actually a recent meeting between our, our work on the M9 and we went to see the city of Seattle and we met on the 67th floor of the tallest building in Seattle to tell them this, which is painfully funny. <laughs> but anyway, um, so it turns out one of the, the biggest things we've learned is that the basin effects are really important. OK, so now I want to show you what we can do with output like this, in particular when we're imagining things like the landslide. All right, so this is a picture not from Cascadia, but instead from New Zealand. Um, that was just taken a, about a month ago by my graduate student, um, and this is an uh, image of the seaward Kaikoura range, which um, is affected, as you can see, 
um, by the 2016 Ted Corps Earth Day Parade. You can see us, there's a lot of um, still very fresh looking landscape, or sorry, landslide scars across uh, this mountain range. So we know that when we have earthquakes, um, it's traumatic and there are many thousands of landslides that get triggered from these events. And so what we want to do is, is, is try and um, predict what that might look like for an N9 earthquake. And so I'm going to show a little bit of work by Alex Grant, who's now at the USGS. And what he did is he took the output of the simulations and he used that in um, a new mark analysis to try and predict co-seismic uh, landslide displacement from the modeled strong ground motion. And then uh, my graduate student, Sean LaHewson, he's working on in, an inventory. Um, so he's attempting to map and, and date and look for large spatial patterns in Cascadia co-seismic landslides. That's any landslides maybe from 1700 or possibly from earlier events. Um, you can imagine that this is pretty difficult because unlike that Kaikoura situation or, or like Nepal, which today is actually the anniversary of the Gorkha earthquake, another place where we saw massive um, landsliding in the hill slopes, Unlike those events where you might have a map from before and then a landslide map from before, then you know the event happened and you can go right out there and you can map the landslides and you can do that kind of before and after. We don't have that luxury in Cascadia, right? The last event happened in 1700 and we have a lot of landslides that have been happened since that have nothing to do with subduction. And so it is a little bit difficult um, and, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about, about that uh, in a minute. Okay, so first let's look at this model output. So this is a, a map showing peak ground acceleration. Um, and this is, this is the, ad, uh, the median peak ground acceleration, or PGA, from all of those model simulations. And so you can see the warmer colors are where you would expect them to be that are closer to the trench. Um, and um, as you get away from the trench, you have um, a less intensity of ground shift. And so even though Seattle, which is in that little blue box there, is not right on the coast. Um, Alex decided to start his analysis there for a couple reasons. One, you can see that um, even though it's not as dramatic as the shaking of the coast, there's still you know, 0.2 G that would be affected uh, or would happen in Seattle and, and anywhere from 0.1 to maybe 0.34 is the range that you can see, depending on things like directivity and the location of those sub events. Um, but the thing about Seattle is that we, we're notorious for having unstable hill systems, right? So we know that the landscape is quite vulnerable. Um, there are plenty of steep slopes. The material is it's very hard to find bedrock in Seattle. It's mostly very weak glacial deposits, including very porous sandstones that sit on non-porous uh, clay, which makes for a really um, dangerous combination. Um, and we also know that this is a, this is a population center, obviously. Uh, you know, it's also where the University of Washington is, so it made sense for us to start our analysis there. Oh, what I'm showing here is a map where there's color-coded dots of, of landslides, um, historical landslides. So you can see um, that there are quite uh, a bit of them. Uh, there are many of them. And they, they tend to be focused along the bluffs of the Puget Sound or along the drumlins of the Pacific or basically anywhere where there's steep slopes or the potential interaction with water. All right, so here's the recipe of what Alex is doing. So you, you find yourself a place, so in this case, we've got Seattle have some sort of gridded slope data. You also need um, information about material strength and um, ground saturation. Um, and then uh, you need to couple that with some um, um, equations that you use for, for different landslides. Um, and then um, from that, what you can do is a, as a Newmark analysis or you know, a hazard model where we um, uh, consider the probability of co-seismic block displacement given the shaking intensities that are coming out of our seismic simulation. So just a little bit more about the modes of failure that we chose. So in this case, we decided to have two modes of failure, shallow translational slides and deep um, rotational slides. And from those, you can just um, have an equation for a simple factor of safety, sort of is it failing or do we expect it to fail or do we expect it to be stable? So here are some equations that we use for that. And what we're really interested in this case, though, is um, is, the, is how close are we to failure, right? So the, you might have a whole bunch of cells that are stable right now, but the real question that we're asking is what's gonna happen when they are um, exposed to strong ground motion? So what we can do is we can, we can, can consider what the yield acceleration is. What's the acceleration above which downslope motion will occur, right? So if a factor of safety of one is sort of right on that edge of safe, what uh, kind of shaking do we need to trip this into um, instability? 
And so um, here I'm showing that uh, yield acceleration versus ground acceleration. And what you can see is that you know, if the slope can be considered strong relative to ground shaking if your yield acceleration is much greater than the PGA. But in cases where the PGA is much greater than um, KY, then your slope is weak and it's going to fail for you. And so Alex has been busy generating a bunch of maps um, from that output. And uh, he's done this for both dry summer conditions and wet winter conditions. And if you're looking at this, trying to figure out where the colors are, you're not blind. <laughs> it's actually really hard to see um, because they're here, but they're really focused in, the, well, they're cell by cell, and they're focused in you know, just a few clustered areas. So I'm going to try and make this a little bit better by zooming in on West Seattle, which is a place that has a lot of um, landslides. Hopefully you can still see, I'll, I'll use the pointer to try and connect your eye a little bit here. So here the shallow translational slides are the, are the pinks and the deep rotational slides are the blues. And what you can see is that during the summer, there's this area here um, has quite a bit of shallow translational slides, but you're not seeing a lot of deep rotational slides. And then though once we introduce water or winter conditions, you can see that there are um, the addition of many more deep rotational landslides. What he's found is that um, he sees a 515% increase in areas of greater than 5% predicted probability of deep rotational landslides from dry to wet. So I think one of the main take homes here is that we hope that the next magnitude nine event happens in the summer <laughs> because it'll make a really big difference um, to Seattle. And um, I'm not gonna talk about it here, but Alex has also done a lot of really neat work where he compares an M9 event versus a Seattle fault event, which is a fault local to our city versus um, a Nisqually type event, which is the, an earthquake on the downgoing plate. And what he finds is that even though the M9 event is big and scary and dramatic, um, it's actually much worse when we have a Cascadia Fault event because it's so much more local. Um, and in all cases, we want it to happen in the summer <laughs> every time. <laughs> okay, so um, that's, um, that's what, those are some preliminary, some new results out of Alex's work. Um, we recognize that this is far from the places Table. There are many other places that have a higher PGA, and we're really interested in doing next, taking that same kind of analysis and applying it to places like um, uh, the Olympic Mountains and uh, the coast ranges, places where we have high topography and are much closer to the truth. So that's where we're headed with this next. But we don't want to just model it and make predictions. We, we still, I mentioned that it's tough because the last earthquake happened so long ago, but we're not giving up on trying to find evidence for previous co-seismic landslides in the landscape itself. And I think that's really important um, to compare to our models um, and to see you know, an iterative process that we're working through. And so I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about some work um, that we've been doing um, uh, to try and get a, a better sense of where the M9 co-seismic event is. And this question is kind of rhetorical in some ways because you might be surprised to know that there is not one single definitively dated 1700 landslide. Um, we know they must be out there. Um, it's, so, it's difficult. There's, we could talk later. I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent about why it is that that those may not have been identified yet. Um, but the point is that we don't yet know um, where are the M9 co-seismic landslides. Um, and, I, and I think it's important to note that you know, we, we're not just looking for one, right? We really want to have some information about the spatial patterns or spatial and temporal patterns of how these co-seismic landslides are generated. So we want to have information about you know, not just one or two, but many hundreds or thousands of landslides. So I'm going to just take a moment to tell you a little bit about how we might get an inventory of dated landslides at that current distance. And, and so to tell you about that, um, I need to just do a little sidebar, tell you about a project um, near to uh, the Oso landslide. Any of you may have heard of the March 22nd, 2014 Oso landslide because it was one of the deadliest landslides in United States history. Um, 33 people were killed on that day by this long run out uh, landslide here. So it was really dramatic. Um, uh, so I'm going to share with you some work done in collaboration with Adam Booth at Portland State and my colleague Dave Montgomery at the University of Washington. Um, and of course, Sean will be doing a code in this project. Um, here I'm showing you a Google Earth image of the North Fork Stiligwamish River Valley, which is the river valley that the Oso landslide um, spilled into. So if I gave you a few seconds, the best geomorphologist in the room might have a way to sort of pick out the rest of, um, you know, what the rest of the hill slopes look like in this image, but it's pretty hard to do, right? I mean, this is really obvious. The river is pretty obvious. So 
but looking at the rest of the landscape, it's pretty hard to see what else might be going on. And this is the LIDAR of the same exact place. And I can't really think of much better examples of the utility of LIDAR data than in trying to map landslides in the Pacific Northwest. And so when you see it like this, it's startlingly clear that the Oso landslide, I'll just point out here, so here's a map of the many other landslides that are in this region. Um, the Oso landslide happened right here. This is the precursor landslide to the Oso landslide. And the, the community of Steelhead Haven is where most of those people were. So everybody except for two poor souls who happened to be driving on the highway here at the very moment that this landslide came across the road. They were all in this community. And um, you know, they knew about this landslide, um, but they thought they were safe over here because it had never come across the road. But when you look at an image like this, what you see is that there are plenty of other examples of huge, big landslides that have, in fact, gone across the road. And so a really important question when, when thinking about um, things like risk and things like place is how old are these other landslides? Like, did they happen a really long time ago and aren't an issue, or are these things happening fairly regularly? And so in order to address that, you know, we have to have some information on age and place. And so how do we get timing on landslides? <laughs> I really love this picture because it's such a classic advisor student thing, right? Ad advisor hovering over student while doing nothing but holding like some tall thing while student does everything. <laughs> um, so what Sean is doing here is he's digging in a landslide deposit that has a small exposure from a little river gully, and he's looking for wood that's in free deposit, wood that would have been um, killed, uh, you know, trees that would have been killed in the act of the landslide that can provide um, some sort of timing on and so you might think, okay, great. Well, you can just go around and you can use carbon-14 to decay all the landslides. And the, the truth of the matter is you can do that in some lucky situation, right? So even if you had all the money in the world, you're never going to have access to all of this wood, right? Because the world is um, pretty reticent to let you, you know, and it's just not always easy to get there. But even more than, than cost or um, access, I'd say one of the biggest issues is that we're talking about trying to keep thousands of trees. This is just not reasonable. And it's really not reasonable because you can't always find wood. I mean, if I showed you a picture of the Oso landslide right after the event up close, you would see that parts of the slide exposure are just chock-a-block full of huge trees everywhere. But then there are other parts of the landslide that have no trees at all. So now you fast forward hundreds or thousands of years and try finding that needle in a haystack. Try finding that one tree. You have to have an exposure to it, and you have to find it. They're not always there. So we need something else. We can't just use so the something else is actually locked in the landscape itself. So for hundreds of years, geomorphologists and geologists have known that landslide deposits move over time. So this is just a little cartoon showing you that when you have a landslide that really roughens up the landscape, you have all kinds of things like hummocks and um, back to scarps and tension cracks and all kinds of things that roughen the landscape. But as time goes on, things smooth over, and eventually, you know, rivers take back hold. Um, and then really, you know, towards the end, you actually roughen it again just a little bit by having a gully system. But the rest of the landscape is the same. Okay, and so the good news is, is that we can use this as some information about timing. People have done this for a very long time. It's a relative information. But we'd like to do more than just let this be a relative information. And we can do that because we know something now about how it is that the land surface changes over time, right? It doesn't happen randomly. It, it happens... Um, by equations like this. So this is nonlinear hill slope sediment flux. So we can make some predictions as to how that stuff will go over time. And this is a model that I'm showing here of age, which is roughness of a deposit over time. And this is a modeled landslide surface according to this equation here. And what you can see is that there is a predictive curve. And this is really valuable because if we have just a few pieces of information about absolute age from the weeks or the sand, get a landslide here. Then we can calibrate a surface roughness age curve. As long as we have LIDAR, where we can get a surface roughness measurement from our other landslides, then we can estimate their absolute age, which will allow us to get at least some sense of timing for hundreds or thousands of years. And so when we did that in this area, you can see these landslides are colored by, um, by age bands. What we see is that there's quite a range. Um, all of these old Landslides are not all ancient. Some of them are quite young. But you can see that when we do things like get a recurrence rate, what you see is that on average, there's one big gully um, 
long run out landslide about everything that happened. And then um, in a companion piece led by Adam Poulos, you know, he expanded and mapped over 200 landslides up and down this valley. And from this data set, we can do some really exciting things like look for um, changes in space and time related to things like climate change or the onset of an earthquake. So it's really valuable to put timing on data sets that are this large. Okay, so the idea is we want to take what we've learned um, from the North Fork Stiligwamish Valley, we want to try and apply it to the Cascadia subduction zone, and we want to look for um, spatial and temporal clusters of timing of landslides. And so I'm focusing in here on Oregon, in particular um, a part of Oregon that has um, uh, the Paiute Nation. And I'm doing that because we can't just take what we've learned from the North Fork Stiligwamish and use it here. We have to recalibrate our curve because the rocks in that valley, they weren't rocks at all, they were actually glacial sediments. So if we want to try and apply this to the bedrock of, of the um, coastal ranges, then we need to recalibrate the types of rocks. And we're focusing in here on the Ori Central Oregon Coast Range because not only is the study there, but we know from um, great work by Josh Waring and others that there are plenty of deep-seated landslides in this place. So this is a good place to focus um, on you know, trying to look look for some that may have been generated by the uh, seismic activity. So in order to do this, we need to, we need to have mapped landslides. It can't just be any old mapped landslides, so we're really just, we need to, we need to just map the deposit itself. That's what we're interested in. Um, and so uh, Sean and two very industrious undergraduate students, Kyle Lowry and Valerie Bright, have been mapping these landslides. This should probably be 4,000 by now, and this box has probably been in here. Uh, but the idea is that we want to map out all the different landslides in this area really only want the landslide body itself for our surface roughness um, mapping. And so this is just one half of it though, right? So now you know, we, we've got this, we can start working on the surface roughness, but we need to calibrate what the timing is. So the good news is um, we're not the only people interested, obviously, in, in, in looking for um, post seismic landslide uh, timing. Uh, Josh Waring and his graduate student, Bill Strubel, have a, a really nice, um, excellent set of different places where they've been working to get very high resolution um, timing on some landslides. Um, in particular, they, they and their colleagues at Valgamia and with Brian Black have been doing um, a combination of dendrochronology along with um, carbon-14 dating. And in places like this, where you have a, a large deep-seated landslide that does things like block a river, you can get a lot of really good information out of, out of a location like this. Right? So you can get carbon-14 out of the stumps in the landslide deposit like I showed you before, and even in the dammed lake, but then you can add to that things like coring of the little trees. You can know coring is really large and really growthy trees. You can do dendrochronology. If you want to really pinpoint something like 1700, you're going to have to do something like this. Carbon-14 by itself is just uncertain. It's just too large to work on a map of. But so anyway, um, the idea is that in the next um, months or year, we'll hopefully have more points um, that we can use to help calibrate our model. So this is just a few that we have going, but we'll need a lot more than this um, to get that roughness right. So I just have um, a few last uh, slides here to sort of bring this to bring this home from something that I've been talking about so far, which has been sort of coupling surface processes and tectonics over just a single earthquake event to imagining what this does over the long term, right? So I think that, you know, I'm really excited to see what we, um, what we find about, you know, how the coastals respond to a magnitude 9 event. But I'm really tantalized by the idea of imagining how that affects landscape evolution when you have thousands of M9 events over most of the year. So what I'd really like to see is um, a model or models that we couple that help us to stretch across those timescales. And one of the reasons why I think that it could be a profound impact on the landscape is because we know from studies like this, this is Brian Unitas' work in Taiwan, that rivers react to large earthquakes. And they do this because when you dump a lot of sediment into the river, has a strong effect on rivers. So I'm really excited about the possibility of imagining how different a mountain range like the Olympics would look, for example, if you had an earthquake that dumped material from hill slopes into rivers every 500 years on a regular basis versus a place that was aseismic and doesn't do that. And so if we want to do that, um, I think what we need to do is we need to have a surface processes model that has the seismic cycle in it. And we need to make sure that we don't just have rivers, you know, so most of our landslide um, landscape evolution models have rivers, but they don't all have a treatment, a specific treatment of landslides. But for this, what I'm proposing, we would need that.
And so the good news is that you know, there's been a lot of um, recent progress on this front. So a, a nice recent work with Land Lab of shallow landslide probability, some great work by Adam Booth and others uh, with a general deep seated landslide model. So I think we have something we can work with here, but what we want to do is we want to add in the co-seismic cycle to this. And of course, I haven't forgotten the geodynamics tectonics piece is huge in this. The landscape is not operating in, you know, statically. So what we need to do is we need to couple that kind of model to something um, which is generating the topography in the first place. And from an outsider's perspective, it seems like there's been a lot of really great progress on modeling subduction zones, in particular things like even paying attention to how topography is uh, develops even at the initiation of subduction and complicated oblique subduction systems. And I'm really delighted to see, and I hope we hear more about this at this meeting, that there's even progress in connecting the seismic cycle to the long-term topographic evolution at Emory Harder. So I think we have all the pieces in place to really start talking about how to link those. And I'm really excited about the possibility of having models that connect us from short earthquake timescales to long timescales. And so with that, I'm going to uh, say thank you and hopefully this seeds some great discussion. Terrific. Thanks so much, Allison. Um, so we have some time for questions and discussion. Just a reminder to um, ask your questions into the mic. I've got one I can hand you, or there's one back here, so that the folks who are dialing in can, um, can listen. Yeah, Allison, you want to? Thanks for a great talk. I wonder, uh, as to the first part, when you use the scenario rupture computations, to infer a likelihood of landslide. Um, when you compare the numerical ensemble computation with what you get from a simple attenuation relationship, given just the distance from the fault, I wonder how much additional information you really get, because it seems like the scales of the landslides are sort of mismatched to the presumed resolution of the rupture propagation computations, which depend on the VS30 and the regional sites. And specifically, I mean, you were far out, right, in, in terms of where you were in Seattle, where this might be even a bigger concern, but even closer to the rupture, right? Because then you're really controlled by the details of what happened in terms of slip on the rupture. That I'm not, I'm, I just wonder how much additional deterministic information can you gain beyond an attenuation relationship? So um, that's a, a really good question and a really good point. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, I think the biggest issue that we have is what you're pointing out, which is that in the case of the high frequency motion, which is what we care about. So we, for, for landslides, what matters is, you know, above three hertz, right? So that's the, that part of these simulations was generated entirely stochastically from the high stress drop asperities or the locations of those sub-events. So where those sub-events are is absolutely controlling the rupture scale. The problem with that is that we have superimposed, we've changed around four possibilities of where they might be. So we don't actually know where they were in the past or where they'll be in the future. And so it's a little tricky with the models because most of our ground shaking is really tied to that. And so, you know, the seismologists always look to us and say, well, if you map out the landslides in great enough detail, maybe that is how we can figure out the paleo sub event. So, it's a little bit circular that we're trying to use those sub events to predict the ground shaking because in reality, where they are is really what's controlling it. So I think your point is, is a good one. Not really sure the way around it other than to try and find the landslides in real life to help us. So that was really interesting to try to put the landscape development uh, framework and linking it to the seismic cycle time scale. I'm, I was also wondering about, so you talked about co-seismic. Do you think there could be any fingerprint of the post-seismic readjustment in a landscape? Because it's a, kind of a transient, fast uh, episode of deformation. Yeah, uh, so I, that's a really good point. Um, and I don't know, I think maybe Josh can speak to this, but it's a small numbers problem so far. But a lot of the places where um, they, we think we get close to finding 1700, we actually find landslides that are like, 1750 or 1730 or, you know, and it's like, maybe that's a coincidence or maybe it's not, you know, there's a, a time scale where we've shaken and, and disrupted the landscape and there's going to be some transients associated with that. So I think that's really interesting and I'm, 
you know, I, I sort of think the modeling could really help us with that, um, you know, so we can sort of watch it go and, and see those feedbacks. Um, so I just wanted to ask how you distinguish between, say, an, um, a landslide that's not related to the seismic cycle that can happen in most, that happen in tropical regions, did rain or et cetera. So in your analysis. Yes. So I thought that would be the first question. It usually is. <laughs> there are so many landslides that happen in the Pacific Northwest that have nothing to do at all with earthquakes. So we don't have a land, we don't have a, a, a loss of landslides. You know, we know that we have them all the time and regularly. So um, this is an issue, uh, you know, in, in a model that we set up, we could have a rule for you know for for precipitation driven landslides and then we could sort of shake the system every 300 or 500 years that's pretty cool um but in when we're looking in the real landscape you know we have this kind of data set where we're looking far and wide i think our best hope aside from projects where we're actually fingerprinting and dating 1700 that's great then you can really say um but if we're going to look over sort of the whole um seismic area and try and have broad um Pictures, I think the best thing we can do is we can hope for spatial clusters and we can use tricks like, you know, we know that the topographic amplification, for example, can trigger um, landslides in different places. So there's, there is information out there that I think can help us to tease between the two. But one of the reasons I think we've struggled to find co seismic landslides from 1700 is because there's an overprint from so many um, landslides that have nothing to do with it. The other reason why it gets back to the first question, which is that uh, this, the trench is offshore. Right? And so the, the work that we've been doing with uh, crustal earthquakes tells us that co-seismic landslides tend to be most clustered and concentrated to the fault itself. Right? We, in fact, a really nice new paper just came out from Kaikoura that shows that very same thing. Our fault is offshore. Right? And so um, if, the, if the topography, you know, if, if sea level changed <laughs> and there were mountains there, you know, I'm sure that we would see many, many more. Um, landslides than we do you know, just because the land is a little far away from the uh, rupture zone itself. Um, uh, hi, Allison. I, uh, I really like what you're, you're doing right at the end, so it's a different kind of question, or maybe it's more of a comment that hopefully will require some discussion at this later, but um, where you were reaching to the thinking about what do we need to really couple surface processes with deformation. And so, of course, I like the idea of uh, developing models that the landscape models that have the hill slopes in them so you can look at the landscape response to the shaking. And then, of course, you need to have a better river model so you know how the river responds to all that sediment in there. But before we go chasing into building more and more complicated models, I think we have to step back and ask, how is the coupling going to happen? And so imagine you compare two landscapes, one with lots of shaking and one with less, but maybe the same net uplift rate. Are you changing the erosion rates? Are you changing the relief? Are you changing the mean elevation rate? Because if the surface processes matter to the long term, it's going to be because they change the stress state in the crust, the change in the topography. So like I said, it's not so much a question, it's just a thing to think about. That you can see ways that those effects will change that, or maybe just directly go out and measure. Do we see that change? If we do, then, whoa, then we've got to incorporate those effects. That's exactly right. I mean, this is, this is why I wanted to present this here at this workshop, because I'm, I don't know exactly how to get it done. Um, but I think um, I'd like to strategize that. But I just really, conceptually, I find it really, um, I'm really sort of, taken by this idea that you just mentioned, which is we can step back. We don't necessarily need to get fancy with our models and we can just ask, you know, a place like the Olympic Mountains, how different is the landscape there over time because we had M9 events? And what if we compare that to a place where there weren't any events? Would there be a difference? That's really the sort of question I'm asking. Hi, Elson. That was a really nice talk. Um, one of the questions that I have about the project is um, it seems like you guys are having some difficulty finding 
these landslides in the landscape. Have you guys considered other techniques like looking at like lakes or other things to try to, to work on that? Right. So, um, yes, and you guys, like, you know, I, I want to be clear that I, we're not the only people, you know, I mentioned Josh's work, but there's also other groups that are working in, and some people are looking in lakes. Um, I know, uh, well, Josh, you can comment on that if, if you want to. And also, I just heard that um, the Goldfinger group so yes, people are looking at the lakes. And I think we're going to have to, you know, this isn't going to happen by one or two people like trying to go data landslide. You know, we need a community-wide look to try and put this 